Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining Morehouse School of Medicine's Office of Alumni and Constituent Engagement for this Transformative Talks Tuesday, Black Male Voices in the 21st Century. As a young Black male, I am truly excited to hear from all of our guests about how they balance work, life, and stereotypes associated with Black men. Now, my name is Cabral Moorhead, and I am a second year physician assistant student at Morehouse School of Medicine. I also serve as the president of our inaugural class. Like our moderator and featured guest tonight, our physician assistant program is full of trailblazers dedicated to leadership, excellence, community service, and philanthropy. Just this year, we created the first fully student funded scholarship at Morehouse School of Medicine, named after a PA trailblazer, Henry Lee Buddy Treadwell. Our moderator tonight, Ms. Idrit, Ms. Iris Grant, exemplifies all of these ideals and then some. Ms. Grant is the founder and CEO of the Genesee Group, a strategic philanthropy consultancy in Phil X, a philanthropy platform. Ms. Grant is a noted TEDx speaker and is known for her trademark right foot, left foot principal trainings. Ms. Grant is an accomplished leader in many aspects, including her membership to multiple directors and advisory boards, including the Association of Fundraising Professions, Lutheran Services Foundation, and the Head Start Policy Council. Without further ado, I introduce to you our moderator for tonight's panel, Ms. Iris Grant. Thank you, Cabral, and I'll thank you for being here and congratulations on being not only a, a PA program student at Morehouse School of Medicine, but for the incredible philanthropic uh, efforts you and that, that student body has performed. Uh, it's commendable. Thank you and good evening to everyone. Happy Tuesday and welcome to Transformative Talk Tuesday, Black Men Voices in the 21st Century. We've got a powerful night ahead of us, a great discussion, hour and a half, Q&A. At the end, you'll be able to ask questions on the platforms, in the chat and in the Q&A of this incredible panel that we have tonight. It should be noted that we have a cross-generational section of conversation we have gentlemen from four spans of generations with us on tonight to talk about lifestyle, philanthropy, their giving, their passions, politics, men among many other things. So you're looking for an interesting night tonight. Thank you to our audience for being here, for taking your time out of your evening to join us. Whatever platform of social media you are joining us tonight, we welcome you. And we ask you and invite you to continue through the evening with us uh, for this star-studded evening. We also wanna thank the Office of Alumni and Constituent Engagement for having this incredible Black Men's Voice panel tonight and conversation. I'm honored to be here um, and we're going to get started. I want to introduce uh, each of these, in these individuals to you. By far, I would not be able to really, really tell you everything about them. Um, as their resumes are impeccable, and, uh, even the, the tidbits that they shared about their hobbies or things that they enjoy. But I'm gonna be able to give you just a snippet tonight about um, who they are and, and what they're doing. So first, thank you to uh, Cabril Moorhead, who is a PA program student joining us tonight. I also wanna to introduce to you Andre Williams. Andre is the former founder, is the, I'm sorry, is the founder and the president of Pivotal Wealth, Health, Wealth Management. Uh, it's an Atlanta-based independent advisory firm focused on building wealth. He received the 2019 Distinguished Service Award for the National Medical Association. He is a graduate of Morris Brown College. He resides in Atlanta, Georgia, so his work and his passions are here. And he is a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity in Incorporated. So I want to welcome Andre tonight. Andre, thank you for taking time tonight to join with us. Uh, next, I want to introduce Jarvis. Jarvis Sam is Vice President, Global Diversity and Inclusion at Nike. Jarvis is a graduate of Rice University, where he studied history, public policy, and sports management with an emphasis in race and gender rhetoric. I'm very interested in hearing more about that. Jarvis will receive his MBA from Brown University and IE School of Business in May of 2020. And he was recently named Forbes 30 Under 30 in sports 
class of 2001. First of all, congratulations on that achievement. Thank you for joining us tonight. And we're looking for some sports talk and some lifestyle uh, conversation with you. Next, I wanna introduce Carl Hill, the fabulous Carl Hill. He is a director of multicultural and community affairs for Coca-Cola Bottling Company, United, um, in, here in the East region. He oversees the company's strategy for engagement with civic and nonprofit organizations in the state of Georgia. Again, creating his passions and giving here, right here in our own state. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Sales and Marketing from Xavier University of Louisiana, a Master of Business Administration from Georgia State University. He is also a board member of the YMCA of Metro Atlanta and, ad and an advisor for Christian Cities 20. 21 Community Champion Awards. Um, and we'd also like to say congratulations as he and his wife are expecting a new baby. So he is adding, adding and multiplying here in the state of Georgia. So Carl, thank you so much for being here with us on tonight. Uh, next, I want to introduce Keith Robinson. Keith is a, an Oscar nominated actor. He is a multi-talented man. Um, he is actually going to be releasing his new album entitled Love Episodic 2 this summer. Congratulations on that. Uh, his latest movie, which he stars alongside veteran actress Essence Atkins for romantic thriller entitled Open, which will premiere on March the 7th. So even though COVID has been happening, Keith has been active and engaging in his industry. Um, you will know him as he played the role of C.C. White in the Academy Award winning film, Dream Girls. You will also recognize him for over 60 opportunities of work that he has done in film and in television, starring in popular works like uh, alongside with Dream Girls, This Christmas, Four Seasons, Fat Albert, uh, CRU, and Saints and Sinners. And Saints and Sinners, I believe, is in its fourth season. So another yet successful um, premiere uh, series going on. Uh, he is a Kentucky native. He attended the University of Georgia and has had an illustrious acting career landing an incredible 60 projects in both film and television. Uh, we wanna thank you for being here tonight and we're looking forward to your engagement and conversation. Thank you for having me. Um, a couple of more incredible gentlemen tonight, uh, Justin Tanner. Justin Tanner is currently the Director of State and Local Government Affairs in the Southeast Region for a Fortune 20 technology company. Seasoned Government Relations Professional, he previously served as the Executive Director of the Georgia Legislative Black Caucus. He was a White House appointee in the Obama administration and a policy aide to former Mayor Kasim Reed. Thank you for being here with us, Justin. Justin received a Bachelor's uh, Degree of Administration from Howard, from, excuse me, the Howard University and the Doctor of Jurisprudence degree from uh, Vanderbilt University Law School. He is a member of Omega Phi Psi, I'm sorry, Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated Alpha Chapter. And he also is a member of HR Butler Not Lodge, number 23 in Atlanta. Thank you, Justin, for being here and for the experience that you bring the expertise to this panel. Thank you. We, we are looking forward to having you. Um, next, I will introduce Terrence Robinson. Terrence is an epidemiologist and an evaluator uh, uh, for Wellhead, Louisiana. He is a native, native of North Carolina. Um, he graduated from North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University in Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, an area that I'm very familiar with. He has a bachelor's of science degree in biology. He is a graduated from, he graduated from Morehouse School of Medicine's Master of Public Health program in 2019. And completing his graduation education, Terrence relocated to New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, where he currently serves as a epidemiologist and program evaluator. And um, we are welcoming him also as a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Thank you for being here with us, Terrence. Next, I have Benjamin Cameron. Benjamin Cameron, also known as DJ Technology. We have uh, actually jammed on several Friday nights at MSM with DJ Technology. He's a master DJ on the air every weekend at V103. 
uh, 103.3 FM, which is currently the number one radio station in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, he's been with them since 2002, and not only can you see him uh, on the weekends, but you also can hear him daily on the Big Tigger show. His talent has afforded him a star-studded list of clients across the country who um, constantly ask for his services, and his voice in the community spans generations across the radio. His ability to blend old school music with the new has made him the DJ of choice, specifically um, as he has lifted voice, the voices and the hearts of thousands during the pandemic and social crisis through his musical gift of enjoyment and, and entertainment with us. So uh, DJ Technology, we thank you for being here on tonight. And last but not least, we have Dr. Benny Harris. Dr. Harris serves as a senior vice president of, office, of the Office of Institutional Advancement at Morehouse School of Medicine here in Atlanta, Georgia, a historical institution. He holds a bachelor's of science degree in industry, industrial engineering from Mississippi State University, a master's of business administration degree in strategic marketing from Washington State University, and a doctor of philosophy degree in educational leadership and marketing from the University of Alabama and the Uni University of Alabama at Birmingham. He is a member of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. And he, um, I will say that he has in the last five years increased fundraising by 165% to help MSM achieve its, uh, make achievements. And it is the nice, ninth highest alumni giving rate among medical schools in the United States. So we most certainly are looking forward to your philanthropic perspective and expertise here on tonight. With that being said, we are now going to get started. Uh, with a lineup like that, I hardly know what to, what to say or what to do. We've got some amazing talent and everyone um, should be excited and very proud of these men that are representing um, from their different walks of life. So I just wanna get started with our first questions and I wanna start with philanthropy because this is a conversation that starts with men in philanthropy, black men, black males and their voices in the 21st century. And I'm gonna start with Keith and Benjamin and Terrence. Um, our, our conversations this evening are focused in men on philanthropy and I'm, I'm really curious to, to hear when you first heard the word philanthropy, when you first recognized that there could be some charitable giving um, and you wanted to take part of that in your community. I'd love you to just tell us a little bit about that as your personal story. And um, I, I wanna start with Keith of how you uh, began to start giving and engaging in the communities. Well, I think uh, for me growing up, uh, I was on the receiving end, I think of philanthropy because I was lucky enough to have a lot of uh, great mentors growing up. So, you know, I consider philanthropy also not only a giving of resources, but a giving of time and, and mentorship. So I was lucky enough to be on the receiving end of that. And I've spent a lot of time in my childhood in the Boys and Girls Club um, of America, uh, playing ball and, and around a lot of older guys who had gone on to uh, make waves in, in the sports field and come back and they would, you know, speak with us and hang out with us during the summers growing up in, in Augusta, Georgia, and Atlanta, Georgia, and so forth. So uh, I think that was my first introduction. I don't know if we called it philanthropy back then, um, um, but that's kind of kind of my intro. And, and when I got in, into a position where I could give back, um, the Boys and Girls Club was the first kind of organization that I was uh, you know, on board with as far as contributing not only resources, but time and, and mentorship. Uh, and I feel like it's, uh, you know, it's imperative, especially for a young black man for us to reach back uh, and to give in, in, in many ways. So uh, I would say that was my first experience with it, uh, but just being on the receiving end. That's excellent because there are so many times it is the things, experiences that we have as children that um, mm -hmm. play into, into our passions and how we interact with others. And so I, I think- right. Hearing, for sharing that and, and, and sharing how you're giving. Um, even with Benjamin, Benjamin, can you define to us when the first time you recognize uh, either a, a charitable act as, um, as Keith had spoken to, you know, the Boys and Girls Club, that's benevolence unto him that's impacted his life. Can you speak to that first time that you uh, experienced that for yourself? Well, ironically, I was actually uh, kind of born into it. Uh, my father was a director of a Boys and Girls Club. Uh, back then, it was just a boys club. So 
Um, that's actually where he met my mother. And um, just being around my father, he was an educator. He was the director of the boys club. I, uh, when I was a little older, he was a principal of a private school. That private school closed down. Then he started his own school. So I was always just kind of raised to give back uh, to the point to where, yeah, even the term philanthropy, it, it didn't really um, register to me that that's what I had been around all of my life. But uh, my father uh, in the community, he was known as Baba Jim. It was my literal first introduction to that of understanding the importance of when you've been blessed, you know, you you bless other people. And that's just that's literally just how he operated. He was also on a community radio station here in Atlanta, Georgia called WRFG. So that was something that he did on the weekends. That was really my introduction to music as well. So it was just a constant, in an extreme nutshell, we were just constantly in that environment. Um, he did consultant work. He, he helped uh, recovering addicts. Uh, he did some some uh, consulting work with actually uh, more school of medicine as well. So it, it was just one of those things where I guess community was the word that we used, but when I got older, I realized that, oh, this is philanthropy and this is something that um, I definitely want to make sure I continue in my life moving forward. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, it does make a difference. Um, we see how others uh, give. We're taught so many things as children. And giving is a, a key principle in how we, we raise our children and how we think of what kind of adults we want them to be in society. So so I'm gonna to turn to you as well and, and ask you to kind of share your definition of philanthropy, your personal definition of philanthropy. And when you first kind of engaged in benevolence coming towards you or towards your family. Um, I, similar to um, the previous individuals who um, talked about their definition of, of philanthropy, I really didn't have a definition. Um, growing up, I, was, I grew up in a rural area, um, so there wasn't much opportunity there. We didn't have a boys and girls club. We didn't have things that I could go to other than school. Um, and so I didn't really know what philanthropy was. I just knew that my parents were always giving, right? Um, so they may have been um, fixing a car. My father and my uncles, they fixed cars a lot. They would cut grass for the women in our community or my mother, we we're heavily involved in church. And so my mom would do mentorship for, for women in church. Um, and so I knew we were always giving, but I just never knew what philanthropy was. And I didn't really experience philanthropy until actually when I when I got into the Master of Public Health Program at Morehouse School of Medicine, I received the Janet Blumenthal Scholarship. And that was my first experience receiving um, philanthropy. But um, through in retrospect, thinking back, I was always giving back. It may not have been with my treasure at the time because I wasn't at the, I didn't have the resources. Um, but I joined a Greek led organization, I filed fraternity incorporated, so I did community service through that. And then when I got to a position where I was able to give back, I, you know, I continuously do that. I consider philanthropy more a realistic thing. So like, I might give money to my brother or or my nephew, and I feel like that is philanthropy to me. Or um, talking to some classmates about different ideas. So my definition of philanthropy is a more realistic thing that I can see the direct impact. And I'm, I'm still learning what philanthropy means as I you know, go through my career. I love that because you're touching on what we call in the industry, time, talent, and treasure. And I absolutely love that. It's very important. Um, and the uh, original meaning of philanthropy actually goes to the the Greek anos of loving and loving humanity. And so uh, wherever we can find benevolence, whether it is our, our little brother or our neighbor, um, it is important and it is important to give. And um, as, we, as we're going through that, I, I would love to, to talk about as We're talking about uh, black men and there are so many stereotypes that black men don't give. They don't engage um, it, philanthropically. They don't give to the community. No, we don't hear those stories as the primal stories in media. Um, I'd like to talk to Jarvis and, and ask you, Jarvis, um, what do you think, it, or if you think there is a difference in the public response between Black men giving and when uh, a Black woman gives? Is there, are, are there gender specific variances in what we hear? Um, you know, we all know that Robert Smith had given a considerable gift to House College, as well as we see, you know, the years that Oprah Winfrey has given. Um, Jarvis, can you speak to that a little bit and tell me if there if there is a difference between uh, how we see and view Black males giving in philanthropy versus women? 
Yeah, there, there's a massive difference. And a lot of it is rooted in the initial rhetoric that we position on Black men. It's this idea or this what's dubbed as like the stylized representation that we position Black men as lacking, as ineffective. And at the same time, all of some of the traditional male stereotypes about the lack of altruistic behavior or this expectation of altruistic behavior, it's amplified. But the way it's positioned on Black men, even vis-a-vis their white male counterparts, is so much worse. It's done in such a way that not only is the altruism not expected, so when we see it happen in the case of like Robert F. Smith, we talk about it much more, but it's then shrouded in like these implications that, well, of course this didn't happen. And when we talk about it from a philanthropic perspective, we think about it at a macro level. The micro example is poor service in restaurants because they assume that as a black man, you will not tip, or as a black individual, you will not tip. And so you continue to see that the same type of pieces of conversation, they continue forward, albeit things like net worth, positional authority, power, et cetera. As it aligns specifically to the comparison to Black women, though, it's because we created this point of view or perspective of who we believe the Black women is. And when we talk about it from the perspective of the in-group, we as Black men see opportunities to relish in and celebrate that Queen's amazing moment of giving and of philanthropy, but to white communities, it creates a continuous justifiable moment of the separation of expectations by gender. It goes back to experiences even during antebellum slavery where the role that women were expected to play, particularly black women who were going through periods of enslavement was that giver, that provider, that caretaker, which created a completely different experience than black men. And so either way you spin it, it all goes back to this idea that when you think about the intersectional experiences of the tougher time that Black women receive, and yet when we talk about it or publicize the media, we often see the Black man continue to be vilified. That is a excellent way to describe that. And we do see that contention. And I've had conversations in prepping for, um, for, this, for this event tonight where the Black men that I spoke with felt very left out because they're giving, they're good guys, they're giving in the community, they're engaging, they're mentoring, um, they are, they're providing for and protecting, and they are being seen in a completely different light um, via media, via our own, our own, our own piece. Um, even North and South and East and West, there's a completely different perspective in that. So that is a great way to look at that. And um, Andre, I'd like for you to kind of chime in on what uh, Jarvis has had and I said, and I'd love to hear your perspective on that and, and your response in to the difference and the variances that we see in gender giving. Andre, you're on mute. My apologies. Um, you know, the idea or notion of black men being providers uh, sometimes gets a little bit distorted. And so I think that carries over into the philanthropic uh, arena as well. Um, and quite honestly, there, there are a lot of Black philanthropists. Uh, perhaps we don't uh, give them enough uh, credit, uh, but there, there, there is this notion of, you know, how much you're going to give. Maybe it's like you give money for this particular year, but major gifts. Um, we don't really target Black men enough. And so uh, Robert's gift to uh, Morehouse was a huge eye opener to say, wait a minute, you know, there are major givers that exist out here. Uh, that can make a substantial impact. Uh, and so I think that kind of shifted the, the thought processes of organizations to say, maybe we need to kind of retool and rethink some things because uh, the nurturer being the woman uh, who's always giving back time, like you said, time, talents, treasures, et cetera, uh, that the black man wasn't really seen uh, in the same light. And so I think that uh, you know, Robert's gift obviously started to create uh, a kind of shift uh, where that's concerned. But there are certainly a lot of uh, Black men willing to donate and a lot of untapped um, uh, opportunities because the conversations aren't being had because of the perception. So hopefully this will begin to uh, uh, change uh, the, 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 uh, the idea of thinking and, and create a, create a uh, greater relationship or deepening of uh, relationship development for uh, Black men. Absolutely. I totally agree. And I'm so excited that we're having this conversation tonight. And I hope that uh, the hundreds of people that are watching tonight are really actually thinking about how they're going to take this conversation back home to their dinner tables, especially at the time of social justice. We have so many conversations that we're having with our young Black men right now. And I'm not sure that philanthropy is one of those conversations that we're letting them know that not only do you have value, 
um, but you can give value. You can add value to, to your community, to your home, uh, wherever, whether it is time, talent, and treasure. And I uh, thank you. I do thank you for that mm -hmm. perspective. Um, I'd like to ask Justin a question as we're following up with philanthropy. Um, there, uh, when we're talking about the Robert Smiths of the world and the Oprah Winfrey, <clears throat> and using those as examples, there are tons of other examples and, and other individuals that have resources to give. But Justin, I'd like you to just think about um, what's the driving force right now with the giving for HBCUs? We're seeing um, a lot of giving and attention coming to HBCUs right now, philanthropically in giving. And I'd love to see you talk about uh, the perspective of men versus women and how that's perceived. But what do you think is the driving force right now with all of the giving, philanthropic giving, high level giving that's being given to black institutions of, of education? Well, thank you, Ms. Grant. Um, I actually love that question. Um, I think it really, really boils down to, you know, one pretty important thing, and that's increased visibility. Uh, I think in the past, you know, when you think about, you know, how, how many of us on the panel grew up, when you talk about seeing images of the Cosby show and seeing images of a different world with, um, you know, Hillman College, and, and you, you start to see and aspire to be some of the professionals uh, that are on TV, the doctors, the lawyers and such. And I think uh, now with the way we consume media, um, young people don't necessarily have the amount of exposure that we did on a continual basis to these institutions, right? And so I think, you know, it kind of boils down to three different things. Um, and this is also within the context of this social reckon reckoning that we seem to be experiencing. So the first is, you know, I would say the civil and social unrest. So what you saw with the George Floyd murder and, um, you know, Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and so many others, right? You know, you have this, you know, broad conversation about race and social justice. Um, the second thing I think is from a corporate perspective, right? You have a lot of corporations who are looking at the problems in society, whether it's through PAC giving, whether it's through philanthropic giving and saying, you know, how can we solve this problem? So they're looking both externally uh, at the outward facing issues as well as internally with their own employees, right? How do we retain more black employees? How do we recruit more black employees? And then once we recruit and, and have them in our, in our, our companies, how do we make, make sure that we're providing them with the, with the resources to thrive and, and grow within the organization? And I think the last thing um, is, you know, through pop culture and, and through politics, right? You see, uh, of course, with, with Kamala Harris, the first African-American uh, vice president on a major ticket, who's a female, who's going to be elected tomorrow. You have, you know, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, who's a FAMU grad. You have uh, uh, Reverend Warnock, who is a Morehouse grad. You have my former boss, Kasim, who's a, a Howard grad. And it goes on and on and on. So I think um, you have the confluence of, the, confluence of those three things. Uh, and, and an elevated platform, if you will, uh, within the context of having the first black president and now having the first female vice president, I think all those things help to kind of, um, you know, um, you know uh, put fire behind the discussion, so to speak. And I would agree. I, I think those are great points that you brought out. And I am very glad for, um, I know some corporations that are doing some major things and are working for, the equality and the equity to bring the lines up. And, and I'm gonna play a devil's advocate for just a minute with that because I've heard two different views on that um, that do span across generations. And I'm going to, um, to ask Carl to kind of chime in on this piece. I'm gonna play the devil's advocate because I have, you know, we always have tokenism. We always have the check boxes. Um, and so although some corporations are uh, giving and some philanthropists are giving because it is the right thing to do and they have a sense of wokeness or consciousness um, for the social perspectives that we are facing right now. But there are a lot of organizations who have been um, caught kind of in the closet with the finger pointed to them and so they are checking boxes and um, I'd love to hear Carl what you think about that on the tales of what um, Justin had brought up of, of how do we balance that? How do we we know that? And how do we understand what there are some of the guilt consciousness that are that do exist that, that are we are recipients of as well? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I think um, number one, you know, we should all recognize and accept that you know a lot of the giving, um, you know, last year in the wake of George Floyd's killing was 
you know, you call it white guilt or reactionary. It was what it was. And I think now's the time that you you see in 2021 that we need to you know, hold these companies accountable, right? So what you saw, you know, in the wake of his killing was immediately knee-jerk reaction. A uh, number of Fortune 100 companies immediately come out, you know, Black Lives Matter, we support it. And then the next question was, all right, so what does that mean? So then they realized, all right, I need to open up the, the bank account. And now we need to start giving out money, which is great. But as you heard so many people say, what, what more can you do, right? We need more money. We need jobs. We need people to get an internship programs. We, we have debt. We have, equi- in, in, we have inequities in you know, technology and Wi-Fi that we're dealing with. And I think right now we have an opportunity in 2021 to say, all right, in the anniversary, to hold them accountable of what has been done, right? So if you go to any of these companies right now, uh, there's a, there's a manifesto of their Black Lives Matter statement and everything they will do to support it. You know, we should all go on those websites and say, all right, we're here one year later. What steps have you taken? Now, now you don't have to say everything needs to be done, right? Some of this is four or five years long, but you can see steps. You can see hiring. You can see giving, specifically giving to, you know, small businesses, HBCUs, to, to, to recognize what their statements are living. So I encourage everybody to do that as we, you know, play a little devil's advocate and realize we, we just need to hold them accountable in 2021. I absolutely agree. And I love that. I love the, the unapologetic terms that you did use um, because some things are, uh, they are what they are. And so we have to look at them based on the individuals and the, the organizations and really come around to full circle of, yes, you said you would do, but how do you continue to do, right? How do we, uh, the only way that we are gonna be able to have um, influence in systemic change is if we, uh, if our advocates consistently give um, and participate in the process of change long-term, right? And so um, with those two perspectives being shared now, I wanna uh, ask Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris, I wanna kind of uh, focus now on what is the strategic long play with that when we have um, so many institutions right now that are not receiving as much money as some institutions are. We've got this balance, this dichotomy of how giving is done. What are your thoughts towards um, what we should do as, 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 as individuals and as uh, leaders and organizations in, of ensuring long-term sustainability with this dichotomy and giving? I think that's very important. Thank you very much. I think everyone has made exceptional points um, the thing that I would like to really to answer that particular question to bring into focus and to bring into play is that one, when you think about African-American males, men who have given, we have a long history of Denzel Washington and Russell Simmons and uh, 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 LeBron James, the list goes on and on. So I don't want us to miss that point that there are individuals and have always been Usher and uh, Chance the Rapper and, and Tyler Perry and the list goes on and on. It may be, how do we tell that story? How do we broadcast that out? Or do we broadcast that out as much as some other parties? Another point I wanna mention is that when we look at philanthropy uh, and giving, African-American give 20%, 25% more of their household wealth than our white counterpart. So we are much more philanthropic than people think about. It's kind of like when folks think about um, Af- uh, uh, HBC institutions to say, they don't give. Well, they do give. Uh, and, and I want to bring out another point that will speak to the question that you just asked. Philanthropy and charity are two different things. Okay, philanthropy is about investing in the whole human, the general welfare of people and investing both your dollars, investing your time, investing your money. You may give to your church. You may give to your, uh, we have many uh, uh, black individuals who end up taking care of their uh, nieces and nephews. And uh, a very, very close community or, or, or the young kid in the neighborhood that they're constantly giving to. All of that is philanthropy. What we're finding ourselves is really on the cusp of, of charitable giving. So when we look at a corporation and they make a charitable gift, that gift is very transactional many times. And so George Floyd and all of these social justice issues and racial justice issues right now are impetus for which people are giving. However, the question is, will these be transactional gifts? What's going to sustain them to really invest in communities, to really invest in the um, uh, uh, 
missions of HBCUs and other institutions that they're investing or will their charitable giving guideline change when this is no longer an issue, when this is no longer in the public media. So part of the challenge for many nonprofit is how do we ensure some level of sustainability or a partnership that helps this corporation or this entity or this individual see it is in humanity's interest to invest in more black doctors. Recognizing that African-American who graduate from medical school graduate with debt of about $300,000 and they're choosing careers that do not pay that off immediately versus their counterparts. They come to uh, institutions with a household income of about $75,000 as compared to the national average of a student who goes to medical school or household income of $185,000. So already you have this disparity gap that exists that creating these partnerships with philanthropists is really what we need to say how we're going to sustain this enormous, incredible mission that HBCUs have and for many years we have debate, debated the value of an HBCU. Are HBCUs still relevant? And what we're finding out today, the answer is yes. Is a resounding yes that they're extremely relevant. Morehouse School of Medicine, Howard University, Meharry Medical College, and, and Drew graduate about 20% of all the black doctors in this country. When there are 157 medical schools in this country, Four schools are graduating 20%, a very major disproportionate number. And that's the reason we're still so very important. That's a great answer. And I, and I know that we have much work to do even as a collective body and how we're engaging. I know that we're going to take questions at the end, but there was a question that came up directly that I think is, um, impertinent, is, is important to this conversation and at this point before we move on. And so I do wanna take note of this, um, this audience attenders um, uh, question. And the, the question was, why are a majority of donations being given to the AUC and the other HBCUs such as uh, Fort Valley State University, University, which needs help and are neglected. And I'm gonna pitch that back to Andre and ask Andre to kind of chime in and give a thought on that. I think that was an important question to address right here at this point where, where we are in that. Andre, you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> I tried to, sorry about that. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, you know, different, different, um, philanthropists or donors have different metrics for the institutions that they decide they want to give to. Uh, you, you take a McKenzie Scott, for example, and that's been the big one in the news lately. Uh, they, have, they have certain metrics for, for, whom, for who they give uh, and, and why and for what cause and what purpose. Um, I remember uh, several years ago, I think it was Dr. Dre that gave $70 million to USC and there was a big uproar about, uh, you know, why wasn't that given to an HBCU, why not us, you know, and this whole thing. And so I think that um, part, of, part of the conversation has to go back to the, the, the building of relationships to make people aware about your different programs. Um, when, you, when people give, they give because it's something that speaks to their value system, uh, oftentimes. Uh, and that's not to say that Fort Valley State doesn't have great programs, uh, but, but how are they engaging with uh, potential donors? Um, how are they discovering who might uh, want to be engaged with them for particular programs or what, what have you. Uh, so I think that, you know, and this is just my perspective, I think those, the, those conversations and those efforts to continually try to seek out uh, donors and uh, sponsors, et cetera, uh, will continue, but it's nothing to get disheartened about. I think that, uh, you know, it sounds cheesy, but a win for one HBCU is a win for all because it's still educating our community. Um, but obviously, you, you know, every, every institution wants to get uh, some of those dollars and, you know, they always ask the question, well, what, what can we do? How can we possibly uh, be a recipient? Um, and really, I think it's just a matter of, you know, not getting upset, but they even probably go back to those people saying, well, you know, ask the question. So uh, what are your criteria? Um, you know, what is it that you seek? And just try to get a better understanding from those possible donors and then, of course, discover uh, new opportunities elsewhere. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Yes, and I'm going to I'm going to ask um, Jarvis, I know Jarvis wanted to chime in on that as well, Jarvis, if you would. I will tell you, gentlemen, this is a heated discussion. We are getting a lot of uh, uh, devil's advocate uh, questions in the queue. But Jarvis, I would love for you to um, chime in on that as well. 
Yeah, I can speak about it from the corporate lens. And here's my perspective. There are a lot of corporations, and this is coming from spending eight years working in the tech industry, where there are five key HBCUs that have proven to generate talent that big companies like Google, Facebook, Twitter, and Snapchat uh, believe aligns to their standards, for example, of engineering. And so they neglect HBCUs six through 20. And that's where I think we got to have a real talk conversation about the experience. It is a path of least resistance for a lot of these big companies and an easy way for them to say, this is a proven talent set of individuals. And I think it's applaud worthy. And I think we do need to continue to double down on our efforts of investment in those institutions. However, so I'm from Houston, Texas uh, originally. So Prairie View A&M and then where my sister went, Texas Southern University, those are, are HBCUs right in my backyard. And I don't see a lot of the same conversations happening there. Fortunately, McKenzie Scott did provide a grant to PVAMU more recently, but, but it's because people aren't seeing that talent side of the house as well. When we think about internship programs, apprenticeship programs, how you actually build a full ecosystem of wealth creation for the community, a lot of these companies don't want to do the work that it takes to actually bridge that gap understand what is the curriculum set being provided at these institutions that we don't know that much about, be part of building, learning, and giving those students opportunities where many of these companies aren't positioning themselves. And I'll tell you, I use my position at Nike in, in alignment to this and making sure that we are going after those students that are at different HBCUs than those that are often served up to us so that we're spreading the wealth, we're spreading the impact, and so that the focus on value creation becomes more than just those that we often hear about or see about, or quite frankly, that other competitor companies have pre-vetted for us. Yeah. This is good. I wanna, um, I wanna take one more add in. Um, Carl, I wanna get your thought on the same, staying in the same vein. I wanna get your thought as well. So I'll say this, you know, professionally, um, I do oversee a lot of HBCUs and our marketing here. And then personally, I'm a third generation HBCU alum. Um, Grandfather went to Morehouse, uh, other one went to say, South Carolina State, Mother Spellman, Father Fort Valley, and I went to Xavier. So I look at it from another lens as I see the, the corporations give and you, you're dead on that they go to the top ones in the major markets. Because if you think about a business, you want, the, you want the most bang for your buck and it makes sense. But I'm also gonna give a challenge to all the HBCU alumni out there, to talk it up. Because one thing that you always hear from your institutional advancement office and a lot of the VPs advancement that I know and work with is that they're always reaching out to the alums. And, and while we think about giving, I think someone said it earlier that, you know, while you know, I didn't have the, the resources, I gave my time. And I think we just need to talk it up in our circles and talk about your, your schools, your undergraduate experience, and be cautious that when, you, when you're outside of mixed company, meaning if we're not around a bunch of HBCU alums, you might want, want to talk about the struggle that we had, you know, a sophomore and junior year and all the stuff we didn't have, because I think while we come from a place of love internally in the circle, right, in the culture, you know, everyone doesn't see that if they went to a PWI. So you want to be cautious of that one. I see that a lot, that you just got to make sure that we promote HBCUs in the same light that these PWIs have been seen in these big state schools. And we'll be able to get the attention that some of the large HBCUs get, like the AUCs and Howards and Hamptons, and you get the smaller ones then to come up a little bit more when we we speak them up. That was, is a, that was, is a great good. point. We're gonna we're gonna keep them moving into action. I'm gonna um I know I want to get this is a hot topic for us, and this is why we are here. Um, I'm gonna get some re more responses at towards the end, but I do want to move on to the next uh, topic because it does talk about um how we engage. So I want I know everybody's gonna have another thought, but I want you guys to hold it just for a minute. We're gonna go back to that because our chat is blowing up with this. And I think that this is a really good conversation for us to have. I do wanna move right into lifestyle because we've got four generations here. We've got eight amazing men here and you're all extremely very different and then very much the same. Um, so I wanna, we wanna do something a little bit fun for a second. We wanna put, uh, the married men versus the single men right now. We've got a little bit of a challenge here in conversation with you. And so um, I want to talk about, when we talked about George Floyd, we talk about the death of George Floyd and, and so many others, um, the list would go on and on and on tonight. But um, some of our audience wants, wants to know how your experience as a Black man impacted your parenting. 
right? Um, so there's some variances in that. So I want to start with Keith. I want to uh, talk to you. I know Keith is a, a is a, a an engaged family man, and Keith, I want to know what your perspective was when you, when all these things broke out. How did it impact or change your alter your your parenting or your thought of parenting? Um. Well, for me, I had when all this stuff broke out, I had my first child. My first, my my son is nine months old, so. Uh, this is pretty much all I know as a parent. And I, it just made me that much more uh, anxious about him being out in the world. And me, uh, when he gets to that age where he's moving around on his own, giving him the talks about how he's viewed, how he's looked at, uh, and just be able to reflect back when he's old enough. And I can tell him that, you know, he was born in, in the middle of a, of a, a major human rights, civil rights movement and a major uh, pandemic. And a lot of the things that, uh, you know, this 2020 was probably the, one of the most monumental years, I think, that we've all experienced since we've been alive. So, and that's his first year on, on Earth. So for me as a parent, that this is, I don't know the before because it's kind of like, as I'm seeing the headlines, I'm feeding my son. So it's just kind of feeding into my whole psyche of, uh, you know, how my parents raised me. I think they were able to let me uh, get on my bike in, in the morning before the sun came up and I wouldn't come come back until the sun came down. I'd be out moving around and very free with me, but I know that that's not going to be the same case with my son because times are so much more treacherous right now. So um, I think I'm getting informed uh, inward, inwardly and outwardly uh, every day as a, as a new father. So uh, it's pretty interesting. I think that is an interesting perspective. And, I, and again, congratulations for you. Thank you family, um, what a challenging time as a black man to, to have a child born and you have one perspective based on your experiences and then you see the whole world kind of flip upside down in the middle of, of this. And um, I wanna flip that to kind of Carl. Carl, I'd love to hear uh, how things have affected your parenting as a black man and um, what experiences have you chosen to share or share, to share with your children, share or not share, with children in the light of uh, George Floyd and, and the social issues right now? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, you have a seven-year-old son, a five-year-old daughter and um, upcoming daughter in April. But I think the largest one that I would say is that it's, uh, you know, the events of 2020 has forced us to share a lot more than I would like to, quite frankly. Uh, but you couldn't escape it, right? You, you got Sesame Street coming on board talking about race. Um, and and El, Elmo and, and it's just it's just something that has been uh, and dated. And if you think about the technology the kids uses, you really can't censor what they see. That you know you have commercials come up. So unfortunately, especially for my seven year old, you know we had a conversation probably a lot earlier than we would like about race and talked about you know certain friends who were white and you know he really understand it. You know he was like you know, he's just he's a person, but we thought it was important that he understood that he was black to make him understand that as he you know, starts to grow up and he hears certain things, right? That he understands that perspective that he should own that uh, from his identity standpoint. So I think it's just forced us to have maybe a more proactive uh, role in that identity than I think other generations had. I, I, I believe you're, you're absolutely right. And the, the, the male role model inside our homes and, and externally in our communities is so important. And these conversations are so important. Um, and it is unfortunate that we've got to have them at such a young age, right? They don't get a chance to really be just children. I remember when I was a child, it was, it was, it was you know, it, like, you, like he said, you could go out at sun, when the sun came up and come back in at a late hour, you know, I come back in when the street lights came on. Um, but you didn't have that, that fear. I didn't grow up with that fear. And now there's a really different reality that we have to equip our children with. Um, Dr. Harris, I'd like to point that same question to you um, as a father of sons. I, I'd love to hear what your perspective is right now with your sons and, and their age and how you're, yeah. you're dealing with that with them. Well, thank you. I have two college age sons. Um, and when all of this happened, uh, my wife and I spent a lot of time really thinking about, um, well, being afraid for our sons. Um, and we've always talked to them about um, how to respond to cops if they get pulled over, both of them uh, drive, and uh, how to be respectful, how to say yes, sir, all those types of things. We also uh, um, uh, told them that if you get pulled over, call us immediately, put us on the phone. Uh, because that was really, really important. 
Uh, I think part of what we deal with is that uh, our young people and our kids grow up in such diverse environments. And so while you don't want them to, um, and they have white friends and they have Asian friends, they have Latino friends and all these different diversity of friends. And then they grow up in middle school and elementary school, they're just, everybody's the same. And then all of a sudden they start seeing people being treated differently or them being treated differently. They start even the classroom and those types of things. So those become really, really difficult conversations to have about the reality of America and the reality of being black in America and how people will make decisions with you just about your race. And we've had these conversations all the time, whether it's in the workforce, whether, whether it's uh, 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 athletic conversations, et cetera. So when this happened, it was a real, the same thing that just happened on the Capitol. We're telling them to be vigilant. We want you all to don't go anywhere alone. Walk with, uh, uh, take a friend with you because there are people who will target you just because you are black. And so <clears throat> what it has done for me, uh, you know, coming out of, uh, out of integration, uh, taking place in the state of Mississippi in the early 70s to uh, uh, being one of the few African-Americans at Mississippi State in my classroom to seeing this whole cycle of racial behavior and racism becoming much more perverse as it was in the 60s and the early 70s. So it's just taking me back to those days and those experiences and said, things have not gone. The thing that I'm most proud of, however, are that our young folks are more vigilant. Our young folks are, 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 are standing up and saying what is not acceptable and are much more vocal about their rights. Black Lives Matter, those types of things. Uh, and so I respect them because they were very involved in some of those demonstrations and, 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 and taking pride there. But it does cause us to be much more vi vigilant and to have to think about race as one of our frames that we look at when we talk about just growing up in America. Absolutely, it, there, it's, it's, um, it's just powerful to hear all three of you as fathers um, speak and have the same concerns and having different degrees and different levels and different ages that you're having the same conversations with and the same concerns uh, same concerns about. So we're going to switch over to the single men because we have some ladies in our audience who want to hear from the single men. And we want to know how, uh, as a professional, um, how you would deem uh, being uh, both a prof professional, successful professional, and also being what many would consider financially successful as black men, how do you feel that your uh, financial success has altered your perspectives or the stresses that you have experienced during this whole 2020 experience? Um, what's it been like? How's it changed your, uh, your, your spending habits or your, uh, your dating habits? What, how has any of this played a role um, in your personal life. And I'm going to start with, uh, with Terrence. Terrence, how has that impacted you? Um, obviously, it's impacted me negatively in some, in some aspects of life. But honestly, I feel like COVID in general has taught me how to cultivate different relationships, how to actually date more effectively. I'm not the best communicator, <laughs> naturally. Um, and so I think through COVID, through this experience, you had to like forge different relationships in a different way, right? So like your dating looks different. So can't just go to like a nice restaurant or somewhere like that. I have to do like more FaceTime, talking to people more, like, you know, getting to know them a little bit better. So that's that's been a pretty good thing. Um, also it just made me pay attention to my mental health as well. Um, we had so much idle time. Um, and so, you know, normally I'm playing basketball, I'm going out to a bar, like, you know, I'm not like being with kids. So I'm just, you know, but loose and free, you know, so like I'm just having fun. And um, I think through this, I've been able to be more sedentary and sit at home more and say, hey, like there are some things I need to work on mentally, you know, to make me the best individual that I can be. Um, and so I've been taking advantage of therapy. Um, that's something that was totally a foreign concept to me. Um, I, we didn't, I didn't know about therapy or mental health in general growing up. Um, and so this helped me find out who I am more as an individual through, through this um, pandemic, as well as other ways to have fun and not spend endless amounts of money. The shopping for me kind of hasn't stopped. Like I like clothes, I like, you know, I like stuff like that. So I always buy stuff. 
But um, other than that, it's been a, a way for me to actually look and see, like, how do I save money? How do I, like, create wealth for myself? Um, that if something was to happen to me down, uh, happen to my job, that I'm able to sustain my lifestyle. You know, I'm kind of young, so I'm growing up in that, and I'm starting to, like, try to find ways um, to have to sustain my life. And so, so, like, through the pandemic, that's helped me, like, you know, maneuver through that. Um, so, yeah, those are, I think, the, the biggest things that, um, I have seen, obviously, I'm in the healthcare industry, so I look at inequities all the time. Um, and so just looking at COVID and just looking at the racism and undertones of racism and how that's impacted health um, is kind of giving me a different gear on things that I want to do with my life, help me find passions and outside of my job, what I can do, how I can lend my services um, to more of the health ramp and racism. So I've been able to like find ways to make this time the most productive that it can be. Um, because I don't feel like I should just be idle in this time just because it's a pandemic. There's other ways for me to be effective. So, I love that. I love that. Retail therapy is a real thing. Absolutely. And three of us have not been able to truly enjoy that the way we like to enjoy that. I'll put my hand up first. Um, but I, actually, I love some of the points that you made because it is uh, something that we're going to be looking at critically. And we're going to talk about COVID in a minute when we're talking about the post part of the effects of COVID-19, just of, of mental wellness, of people being in isolation. Um, but uh, Andre, I am coming to you. I am coming to you. How has this impacted you um, as, as a Black man in America? How has it changed uh, your personal uh, perspectives of, of dating or finances, or just how has it impacted your personal life? Well, you know, on the social front, obviously, you know, it, it, you have to be more creative with the dating life. So perhaps I'll buy dinner and have it delivered to the home and we can, you know, have dinner over over, over uh, Zoom or Skype or what have you. So you got to be more creative. You got to be more committed to communication. Uh, whereas if somebody's in your presence, maybe not so much. So that's what kind of happens on the social side of things. Uh, Business-wise, now for me, it's been good business-wise because I'm a financial advisor, so you know all of the sponsorship events and you know the travel to and fro and you know courting clients and all that. All those expensive expenses have uh, have declined tremendously. But I've also embraced this time because it seems like the world's kind of slowed down somewhat, so it allows you to kind of focus on some of the, the the goals you might have for your business, the goals you might have for your your personal development, and uh, that slowdown has really been uh, beneficial. But, to, you know, from a business perspective, being able to use Zoom and, uh, you know, all the various technologies, DocuSign, et cetera, it, I really haven't had an interruption on the business front in that way. And I think a lot of my clients have actually been more focused on, OK, I'm here. You know, I'm not spending all this money on trips and vacations and travel. Let me do something productive. Let me put some things in place. So that's all those that mentality has actually helped, uh, you know, me thrive with, you know, clientele and, and, uh, and, and business development and so on and so forth. So um, do I want to be back out and travel? Obviously, yes, of course. But, um, you know, I don't mind, you know, uh, saving a little bit in the pockets for, for a period of time. And I'm hopeful that this, uh, this pandemic will be over here soon. And of course, MSM is getting out the, uh, doing their part to help uh, administer the vaccine. So I'm hoping that third quarter will be, we'll be back out and back to some normalcy. We'll see. Yes, absolutely. And and when we talk about the new normal, I think we all have to kind of really, we've had almost 12, believe it or not, almost 12 months. You know, when we hit March, it'll be a whole year. Um, yeah. And we absolutely have to have different perspectives. If we have not taken time as Black people to think differently about how we're spending, what we're doing, how we're engaging, how we're having communication, that was a, a key point, Andre, um, then we've kind of missed out on some things. Um, and opportunities that we need to have on this. And I wanna, while we're right there in that space, I wanna go ahead and move um, to COVID because I wanna talk about COVID a little bit. I still wanna talk a little bit about politics, which is a personal favorite of mine. Um, but I, I wanna talk about the vaccine a little bit as we're, we've, we've had uh, God, almost 12 months of COVID-19. None of us expected that. We had the three months where we thought, okay, you know, we'll kind of teetle and toddle a little bit and we'll, we'll, we'll get back to, a normal space, and we have not been in that space. Um, and I want to uh, touch base with Jarvis. Jarvis, I want to kind of get your perspective on the vaccine conversation. To to what's the conversation among you and your peers 
about the vaccine. We, we're very aware of the Tuskegee experiment and, all, and a lot of other things that have not been shared in the media that, that people of color and black people have experienced, um, particularly black men. And I'd love to hear what your peers are saying right now, what you're thinking about the vaccine. Yeah, so I'll speak about it from a couple of different dimensions. I, I think as we think about two uh, intersections within our, our own community, the Black community, I, I'm out, proud, loud, gay Black man. And so I think when we think about the experiences of both queer identities, Black experiences, and those of us that find ourselves the intersection, there's an, a big distrust, particularly with government, with social, and with political, connected to conversations surrounding vaccines and healthcare. It's amazing sharing the stage with these amazing gentlemen to learn a little bit more around where our education uh, in healthcare systems are coming from, where doctors are being educated, because here's where the challenge is. When we think about the Tuskegee experiment, when we look to health disparities, particularly during the 1980s when it came to controlling HIV and AIDS epidemic, and particularly the impact that had on queer communities of color, particularly gay Black men at the time, there's just been this constant challenge where, where, the, where things seem to be potentially resolute, where there were options to do better and be better, there just seemed to be this constant failure on behalf of government at the, the state, federal, and national level connected to these communities. And so when, when you think about folks that sit in that, you know, kind of dubbed political like anti-vaxxer space versus the, the sentiments that I'm hearing employed by a lot of Black communities and even my peers, talking about this discussion, a lot of it comes from, we have been so conditioned to believe that there is a time frame by which vaccines and testing periods of vaccines should prove true. And then when you have sentiment being thrown out that, hey, we're going to ensure that these communities get it first, which while incredibly well-intentioned, has a very negative implication when we're like, no, we've seen this narrative play out before. And in fact, it was utilizing black bodies as lab rats uh, down a pathway of experimentation. And so where I think we have to get to is a space where when we're thinking about vaccine distribution as we're having the conversation for how we overcome some of the challenges connected to the pandemic, we have to recognize the impact that the pandemic itself has had on communities of color, particularly the black community then do the cut across and say, how has this experience particularly impacted folks of Black queer identities, Black women, Black trans identified folks, and use the, the frame of equity, not equality. So equity, think about the needs of those populations and solve there. Like that's the first big step. And then yield education as the second piece and then empathy. And that's what I think is lost. We often approach Black folks with the perspective of sympathy. I feel sorry for, or we did wrong because. It's taking a step back, recognize where you were complicit previously, demonstrate that empathetic capacity, and then try to seek a rollout or an engagement with that community. That's the only way that it's going to be properly well received. Great, great perspective. I'm Je um, Justin, I want you to chime in on this as well and, and talk about that kind of counterbalancing where Jar Jarvis has uh, spoken to and where you also see peers uh, having some early adoptive perspectives of it or some, some, uh, some resistance. Absolutely. Uh, and building off of Jarvis's point, I think the first thing we need to do is make sure that we're acknowledging that the people who are feeling that way, that their feelings are valid, right? Whether it's because they're just scared of the vaccine and what it may do to them, or they don't have um, the information that they need. Um, you know, using myself as an example, I am you know, very adamant about healthcare and listening to the experts and vaccines. And initially, even myself, um, the doubt was going through my mind, having worked in the big machinery of government about how the heck did they approve something in a year that usually takes four, five, six years to approve and push through the system. So something about that, I wanted to kind of see what it would do to other people uh, before I injected that into myself, right? And so after I educated myself about both the Monero vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine and how they don't actually in inject the actual vaccine into you, but, but it teaches your body how to fight the vaccine, right? I became more comfortable with it. Um, but I think the second thing is we need to meet people where they are. I think we need to approach it like we would approach any other campaign, whether it's um, you know folks who complain that the Democratic Party hasn't done anything for them or the Republican Party hasn't done everything for them. You have to you have to reach out to those people and earn their trust and educate them and talk to them and engage in a dialogue, whether it's a campaign, you know, broad marketing campaign or individual by individual. And eventually you'll get there, but you shouldn't. I, I think the mistake, and myself included, 
um, that we put on people is that we place these expectations on people to just get it when they either may not have the information we do or they have valid reasons for feeling the way they do. And so I'll you know, open up to the other panelists as well if they have any other thoughts. I love that. I wanna, I wanna touch on something you said because you really spoke to meeting people where they are, right? Validating how they feel, finding out why they feel that way. And when we talk about philanthropy in a very big perspective, when we're engaging in the communities, we are meeting people where they are, where their need is, whether it's emotional, whether it's physical, um, spiritual, whatever those bases are, that, that is a form of benevolence. That's your time, your talent, your treasure to help educate and to philanthropically have a perspective of engaging and educating our community. So I love what you said on that because you do have to meet people where you are. Even Jarvis spoke to that, where, wherever you are on the tier, wherever you are on the platform, um, wherever, however you identify, wherever you are in the social economic perspective, we have to learn to meet our people where they are so that they feel comfortable with that. And then we have to educate our counterparts as how to engage with us, right? And that is a part of the philanthropic perspective. So I love um, what both of you said and, and how we're engaging. And I, I know we're gonna have questions in the Q and A on, on that with that. Um, with that, I do wanna get, uh, Keith, I wanna ask you because you've been in LA, in California. California has been hit heavily uh, with COVID-19 and you guys have been, uh, experiencing some lockdowns that the rest of us uh, outside of New York have not really experienced. Can you just talk a little bit about that and, and maybe perhaps perspectives of in the industry, what you're hearing from your peers uh, regarding the, the COVID-19 and the vaccine? Well, I think, um, yeah, LA has definitely, LA County has specifically been hit the hardest. I think we're like the new New York. I attacked New York from the beginning. I think we're in that position now. Uh, we're, we're considered ground zero. Um, and it's impacted, of course, the, the, uh, the black and Latin communities uh, the hardest, I think, and those who are forced, who are not able to social distance, they're, they're kind of, in order to survive, they have to, you know, be out in the mix and, and continue to main, maintain the essential routine. So it puts them at higher risk. It's heavily populated. And um, I think because it's such a transient city, it's so many, it's so much moving, it's so many people, it's people coming in and out, it makes it very difficult to, to get a hold on it. Um, as far as the industry, I myself, I've had about 27 tests because when you're shooting uh, production, they're, they are, uh, they're testing us every day uh, before the day previous. If you work one day, you're tested prior. So uh, they've been pretty good, but even with that, if one person tests, positive on a 100, 200 person crew, then it shuts down entire production. And that's been happening a lot as of late. Um, and you can see the difference because I traveled to Atlanta and it was totally lax uh, as if you almost can forgot about Corona. And then when you got back to LA, it is super, super locked down. So they're still trying to get a hold of it. I mean, they're, they're thinking about um, reinforcing some more restrictions. Uh, but it's just tough because I think uh, a lot of it is fatigue at this point. People are just you know, when they say you can come out 20 percent, you know, mentally, we're thinking it's it's good. We're good now. We're 80 percent, 100 percent. So people kind of go overboard. We have holidays. So you see two weeks after a holiday, it, 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 it ramps up. So it's kind of an up and down thing that I think slowly I'm a work in progress when it comes to the vaccine. But I, I, I think I'm kind of turning the corner. I'm not all the way there. I'm like a lot of people who are kind of leery. I want to see a lot of people take it. Uh, but my 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 first cousin, who was a nurse and pregnant, just took the vaccine uh, and I'm kind of, it's kind of getting closer to me. So I feel like eventually uh, I'm going to have to succumb to, you know, taking the vaccine, especially with production because they're trying to, they're in talks now to try to make it almost uh, mandatory as far as production goes, because, you know, you're dealing with such a large group of people who are in close proximity for long periods of time. So it can be almost like a Petri dish. If one person have it, it immediately spreads. So, uh, it's kind of, it's, it's touch and go in LA. So we're trying to get a hold of it. It's like a wild animal, basically. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a, we're all, the whole world is, is watching um, LA County. And yeah. so you, you definitely have our thoughts and our prayers as you um, still continue to, to work and provide what we all need yeah. is entertainment. Yeah. We need a break from the things that are happening. And I, I will share this. I myself, since uh, April, of uh, 2020, I have lost 15 people of friends and family. Wow. Um, 15? 15. I lost three on Thursday. 
of friends of, of uh, oh. former members. Um, and when it starts getting that close, you start thinking yeah. differently about the perspective yeah. and the engagement. And I do believe that we're all really like one degree of separation with this. I don't know anyone who has not been impacted. Um, yeah. It changed the focus of my, my New Year's Day. It changed the perspective. Yeah. Of it as um, as Jarvis and Terrence were saying uh, earlier, you start thinking about life a little differently and how you're engaging and how you're moving. And so I think this conversation tonight, specifically for our Black men, is critical. It is critical yeah. because you are the kings of our community, right? And so we celebrate you all tonight, but we also we we we, we pray and are concerned about how this impacts each of you. Um, as we move forward. And so I want to thank you for, for, for sharing with that. I want to add um, uh, Gabriel to the conversation. He was our, our student that introduced us. I want to add him to this con this next portion of the conversation and ask him to, to, to join us. Um, we're going to just jump into a little bit of politics before coming on down to the, to the wire. I um, mean, I do want to get some good questions in, but I kind of wanted this to be an open freestyle conversation right now. Um, we, you know, we, we often joke with our peers that we are not, our, I do anyway, I joke that we are not our grandfather's generation. You know, sometimes my mom will say, well, your granddad, you know, and I'm like, well, you know, or I hear my peers say that, especially with the civil unrest and the things that are, are happening. We are definitely a, uh, a generation, not to take away from any other generation, but we are definitely a generation that thinks a little differently about things. Um, I'm in one particular generation, and I'm not going to tell y'all what generation I'm in, um, being the lady on the show. But I also think and have the energy of a much younger generation because I'm surrounded by young people all the time. Um, and so I want this just to be, you know, just to kind of freestyle. You guys just kind of jump in where you are. Of, um, in the recent loss with, uh, rep with uh, Representative John Lewis, we've often commented that there's a difference in our generations, the, the way we, we move. And his statement was saying that the protest excited him, right? And, and what history, what reaching we saw in his life, how he was excited. Um, and I'm going to kick it off first with Andre, and then I want the rest of you to kind of just jump in. Um, what's your opinion and what excites and cons or concerns you um, right now, thinking about the words of John Lewis, about the younger generation's way of being politically involved? Like, where do you see us going in the next six or seven months? Because we've got a lot of work to do. Yeah, you know, to me, it kind of felt like a, a great awakening. Because uh, I know back in 2018, I was heavily involved with Stacey Abrams' campaign and going door to door as a volunteer. And a lot of the young people would say, oh, I'm not voting. My vote doesn't make a difference. That was the mindset. And I was kind of blown by that. But I'm like, OK, I can't get upset. This person hasn't been educated. Maybe they need to have a little conversation. But 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 Stacy's efforts to bring all those voters to to the to the uh, to the polls was was amazing. But that type of effort, that type of energy, is now being shown across the country. So I, I share Rep Representative Lewis's enthusiasm for these young people that are actually trying to be proactive with making a difference. The thing that I that I want and I hope that happens is they continue to remain diligent because you know there have been some some key events that have happened. Obviously, George Floyd passing, you know, not passing, but actually being murdered. Uh, you know, Breonna Taylor, there's some things that are kind of in your face that, that people want justice. Uh, and so, so when times aren't as volatile, I want people to understand that, hey, you know, you still need to be involved. Uh, I think Carl was talking earlier about corporations. Well, we need to do the same thing for our representatives. You know, if you say you're going to do these things for our communities, we need to come back and check in. Are you checking off the boxes for things that you promised you would do? But in order to do that, the activism has to be continuous and not just um, uh, the result of some, some event or some act that, uh, that was over the top, so to speak. So I'm just, I, I love the enthusiasm. Uh, obviously we've made a difference at the polls because we turned Georgia from red to blue. So the power, the power in the polls is, obvious, is evident, uh, but there's more work to be done and we just have to you know, stay on the path and continue to keep uh, those efforts moving forward. So I'm hopeful that that will continue because you know we got Stacey's. Uh, I think she's gonna run for governor again. Uh, you know, so so things like that have to continue the movement forward. But we've got to do a, a lot for our communities, and we need our representatives to uh, to be very diligent with what they are promising and delivering on those promises. And those young people can actually help make sure that occurs. 
And, and I want to jump back in here for a second. Um, Benjamin, I want to get your thought and your perspective on this, not just on COVID and the isolation of COVID for a younger generation, but also in the words of, um, uh, of John Lewis, like what's the, what is the new, the new new for us and how do we move forward? How do we engage? Um, well, I think we, one, I am a super grateful and um, happy to see the type of activism that we have going on. I also think that because each generation is different, how we even digest news is totally different, right? So we, we're living in a totally social society. So as we become more active and as we think of the impact of these things that are happening in our neighborhoods or the things that are happening in politics, things that are happening in our government, making them relevant because, well, I'm a millennial. I don't like to admit that I'm a little bit of an older millennial, but I'm technically a millennial, right? So the way that we are now becoming active and I'm working with some Gen Z people and I see how they operate. So I think basically what needs to happen is we can't, I mean, certain things need to say the same, but we can't technically even do what our grandfathers and our parents did, right? So it has to evolve. And as it's evolving, I think we need to really consider where are we going to have the most impact? So if everyone's social, um, so yeah, with this campaign, you know, I'm sure everybody got a million texts, you know? So it's like, I think certain things like that are very effective, um, but also we need to look at how do we reach people where they are? Once again, meeting people where they're at. So as we talk about this generation's uh, activism, I think it's a combination of continuing to do what, what clearly works, but also considering um, how we enter and uh, make sure that we stay relevant in those spaces where uh, the younger generation is. Yeah, and- oh, if I love I, that. Go ahead, yeah, go ahead. If I could chime in yeah I've, I've been in the you know the political and policy space for about the last decade now and um you know i'm not a big person for quotes but but one that kind of has recurred over and over again on the heels of martin luther king uh uh day is uh the arc of the moral universe is long uh but it bends towards justice and i think yeah. you know what king was getting at was that you know change takes a long time and it doesn't happen overnight and i think you know, one of the things that we have to, you know, try to teach and communicate to the younger generation was that, is that, you know, the civil rights movement and things that happened in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, um, we're, we're con still continuing to fight, you know, those same battles today. It's just kind of, you know, um, packaged in a new form, if you will. And, and, and one of the things that I learned working for, you know, Mayor Reed, um, and in the long line of mayors from Mayor Jackson on uh, to the current mayor of Atlanta, Keisha Lance Bottom, that's six African-American mayors, right? Uh, between Ambassador Andrew Young and uh, Shirley Franklin and so on and so forth, right? And, and there are nuggets of wisdom that we as a younger generation can learn from those folks. The, the problem is that, you know, even in 2020, you know, we, we saw the death of Reverend Dr. Uh, Joseph Lowry, right? Uh, former pastor of uh, Cascade United Methodist Church. We saw the death of C.T. Vivian, right? Uh, we saw the death of a lot of these individuals that were around King and, 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 and integrated into the movement, right? And so while we still have an ambassador, Andrew Young, while we still have some of these folks walking around that we can talk to and, and hear stories from, I think it's, it, it would behoove us to encourage the younger generation to do that and to interact with these people because while, 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 you know, technology and, and, you know, the pace of things has gotten quicker, I think there are some core fundamental principles that are tried and true throughout generations, regardless of whether or not it's, you know, 2020, 2021, or, you know, 1920, right? And so um, that's all I would say, but, but I do uh, also agree with my other panelists as well. Yeah, if, if I can add to that. Irish. I wanna, oh, yes, yes. I'm back gonna, and add I, to that. I, I want to have Dr. Harris add, and then I'm going to go to uh, Gabriel. Go yeah. Um, let's remember that Ambassador Young and uh, John Lewis, they were the younger generation then. And so when we talk about, they were not 78 years old marching and fighting those particular battles. When you go to Birmingham and you go to the Kelly Ingram Park, 
what you see are a bunch of dogs barking and biting at young people, at teenagers and middle school kids who have the courage to do what our young people are doing right now, to stand up because there's a consciousness. And what made that time, what made King, one of the things that made King's time so powerful was the media that we had at that time, or they had at that time, which was network television. And that was the first time where they were seeing these type of atrocities uh, in a national scope. So when Johnson and were looking, President Johnson and were looking at those types of things, they were able to hide that originally until the national media started showing it and until it started coming on television, the newspaper. Right now, our young folks, and we have these little, uh, I don't know if you can see it here, but we have these little telephones that are videotaping what's happening to George Floyd and videotaping that. And I think, the, so there's a key commonality here that I think what Justin was saying is how do we instill a social consciousness and the power that our young people have? Because they do have power. And so are we gonna be the influencers that gonna say, let's let your power bend towards justice this way, or is there some other influence that's gonna have their power bending in a different way? So I think the, the ability to sit and listen to what's good for humanity versus what's just good for me. So there are a lot of commonalities in what happened uh, during the civil rights movement in the 60s and 50s and coming into the 70s that are happening right now. And unfortunately, it takes these atrocities that increase the social consciousness and get us out of our comfortable zone. Because many of us that grew up in the 80s and the 90s, we got comfortable. We thought that if we get our education, if we work very hard, if we get a job, if we buy a house, if we get a family, then we are experiencing the American dream and we will be respected as a result of that. And what we're learning is that we are still black and there are still biases. So we talk about what's happening from a political perspective. President Trump did not get elected because 20% of the people voted for him. He got elected because more than ha almost half of the country, the voting population were voting for. So that gives me a lot of insight on the psychology and the psyche of America. So I do think there is a lot of commonality. There are a lot of things that we have in common. We have to tell those lessons, tell those stories uh, uh, and spend a lot of time with them. Having three uh, 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 children who are in their 20s, recognizing that I, as a parent, I have to spend a lot of time with my sons, especially pouring into them what I believe are important values and consciousness for America because they're not getting their information just from me. They're getting their information from uh, all type of media sites, all type of website, all type of Facebook, from their friends that are challenging them. And have I equipped them to have empathy and have a value for those who are, who are less, who have had less than they have, have had. So um, I think the young people in the 60s are the same young people that we're experiencing. It was just a uh, uh, the consciousness was tilt towards justice. And we want to continue to see that happen. Thank you, Dr. Harris. This is just, I, I don't know about everybody else, but I think this is just amazing to have this diversity and to have the experiences of the, the past and the present um, as we start looking towards the, the future. And I, I, I want to have um, Gabriel just give his expression. He is the youngest member here. And as um, one of the youngest members and the students at Morehouse School of Medicine, I, I would love to give him an opportunity to uh, just kind of express um, uh, how you feel the, the impact has ha had on you right now. Certainly. So uh, as you stated, um, as one of the youngest members, or probably the youngest member on this panel uh, currently, um, Something that really excites me about the uh, uproar and the fever that uh, we experienced over the past year or two with certain events um, is that um, really having this access to social media has allowed us to have national conversations at a much quicker pace than were, were possible in previous times. So, for example, if you think about uh, our major protests, our major marches back in the 60s or even further back in the 1910s and 1920s, a uh, situation like George Floyd's would take uh, much longer to get out and uh, disseminate throughout the country and, and take a lot longer for us to have to come to a collective national opinion about what happened versus now uh, you can have a national opinion formed within hours of an event occurring. So I think that gives us a great boon and allows us to have, uh, allows us to mobilize a lot quicker. 
And I think that eventually leads to us being able to, um, which really excites me, uh, being able to have a decent, uh, decentralized leadership structure. So we really empower, empower lots of different leaders in smaller communities and it gives everybody a more specialized role in the movement. So for example, when I think of myself and my classmates, uh, it allows us to more so focus on what we can specifically do to aid in the movement, to, to use our abilities and use our talents to the best uh, in the best way possible. So I think uh, being able to specialize in that way and being able to empower each and every one of us to be the leaders that we're capable of being is definitely a big move forward. And I'm actually really excited about the work that not only my generation, but the generations before me and the ones that are coming after us as well, are gonna continue to do to help uh, move this country forward. Thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that. I know that wasn't, um, that was off the cuff and I appreciate, you know, you being, allowing me to have you jump in on that. I do want to give um, uh, Carl and Jarvis and Terrence an opportunity to answer, answer that same perspective. I know we're a little bit slow on moving quickly on time, but I do want to give you an opportunity to chime in on that as well. And then after that, we'll go to um, the Q&A because there are a couple of really powerful questions in there that I wanna make sure that we get to before we close out this evening um, with that. And then I wanna ask everyone to stay because we're gonna talk about how you can give to Morehouse School of Medicine um, and the opportunity to text as well. So I do wanna do that. So I don't wanna lose anybody on our audience, uh, but for Terrence and Carl and uh, for Jarvis, if you have something you'd like to add to that point, I'd love to hear your perspective on that. You know, uh, I'll say, you know, overall, the energy last, last year in 2020, you know, was amazing. I think the engagement, I think someone said that earlier in the political process, is one that I hope continues. And the demonstrations, you said it earlier, and I really you know, took note of that, is that, you know, the young people in the 60s, all the young people of today, you know, I think while the excitement and energy is good, the only thing I will caution is that because of the phone, everyone has a platform. And one thing that's a little different from what I've seen historically from the leaders of the 60s and 70s is always a moral, moral ground that they were on, either through the church or through betting of the elders. And I think while the, the phone is uh, powerful, that everyone has a platform, we want to be cautious of some of the rhetoric that I own uh, bring out, right? And I think, you know, the principles of nonviolence still hold true to this day. And I know there's a, a number of people who feel that uh, you know, maybe that's not getting the meat move moved as quickly as it can. But I always just encourage everyone to continue to be nonviolent and to participate in the processes that we have forth. Because as you said, uh, we turned Georgia blue. So, you know, go Georgia. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. And I, I do want to jump in here. And I do want to ask those of you that have not been philanthropic, um, I want you to think about your time, your talent, and your treasure. And I'm going to ask if our administrator would put the, uh, the text and the giving in the chat. And, and as well as I noticed, um, someone put a very interesting book in the chat as well. So I'd love for you to go into the chat, everyone, look and see how you can, can give and provide and help us with Black guys in the community engagement. Um, and also there, the, some of our panelists have put some information in there. So I'd love for you to look at that book as well. Um, and for, uh, for I'm sorry, uh, parents and, and Justin, uh, for Benjamin, if you had any other statements that you wanted to make or anything else you wanted to say on this piece before we go into the q a i'd love to continue that conversation andre as well yeah just real quickly i think um i'm a millennial as well um and so i think an important point to add is like we are um they need we need to be continue to be engaged in some of the issues that i know we still have the same type of issues but what resonates with people in other generations might not resonate with me and so we have to continue to engage those individuals and find what I know for us um, in, in the millennials, what is important to us and what social issues that we want to fight. Um, because we're not like our grandfathers. We're not, we're not in that mind frame. We didn't experience the things that our grandparents, our forefathers experienced. And so we have to be mindful that we need to be engaged on the way that, on the issues that we feel are important um, because that will stimulate us to continue to be a part of the process. Um, I think we've moved from a, a time where um, in voting, you know, we needed to vote because we, we needed to vote. But now it's more so, I know for a lot of my friends, are the issues that you are 
running on important to me. And these are my list of issues that I deem to be important. And are you engaging me on those issues instead of just me giving you my vote? Um, and so I think that's an important thing to, to remember is that when we are, we're not monolithic, we're not going to have the same views. That's the wonderful um, thing about Black in, individuals. Like we have different views. We come from different lenses. And so you have to be able to engage me where I am and target me and the people who think like me in order to stimulate me enough to want to be a part of the process. And if you're not, then that onus is not going to fall only on me for not participating, but it's going to fall on you for not speaking to the issues that are going to move me. And I think that's what we're seeing a lot in the younger generation is that they're finding the social issues like environmental justice is something super big in my brother's age, and they will not move or budge on that issue. And so I think that's respectable because it's not necessarily like we're going to just do this for you because of just doing it, we want you to do something that's going to be important to us and create a better life for us in the long run. So I think that's just all I want to say. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, before we move into the questions, Jarvis, uh, Dustin, anyone else? Yeah, so for me, I'm actually based out here in Portland, Oregon, which was really deemed like ground zero for a lot of the, the uprisings happening post the murder of George Floyd. So I've gotten to see what youth activism truly looks like and the impact, particularly on the coast, that's been happening. But, you know, two quick points that I'll make. I think Dr. Harris summed it up really well. We got to provide opportunities to teach and train the youth of today about the experiences of the past that led them to have the levels of freedom to engage in the current system and current infrastructure. Because I heard a couple of sound bites while I was out there protesting with them of things like, oh, you know, I, I would not have sat by if I was a slave. I would not have done or dealt with the fire hoses or the dogs. And it's like, you don't get it. There was not that choice rhetoric that you're using. That wasn't the, the status quo at that time. So to so learn the facts and understand the history and see how all of those actions and activities, those historical leaders, those kings and queens, they led to your ability to protest in this way. And so getting them to be conditioned there. And then two, just given the work that I do and getting to work closely with Gen Z and Gen Alpha, I think that the use of social platforms like TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, it's been incredible around information distribution. The one concern that I have for them though, it's the exact reason why people were so surprised last Wednesday with the insurrection is because we curate our feeds so much and the algorithm used by these tech companies curates our experiences so that we're only consuming certain types of information. And it can actually limit the magnitude of the reality of just how bad things may potentially be. And so it's recognizing that what you're seeing on your social platforms that are really good for information distribution, don't let that be the only area that you're consuming from. Be open to actually consuming news and media from a site or a platform that you know may have a directly opposing viewpoint as yourself, because quite frankly, the knowledge of what the other side is dealing with or cooking up may be the big piece that saves you or helps advance your own platform. I love that. I love that. And I'm going to end with, with that because there's a couple of questions that popped up I think are powerful. But again, here we go. We're talking about communicating um, within our own community, like communicating uh, cross-generational, cross-lifestyles, cross-everything experiences, um, and really engaging and talking about and having these moments of understanding and of community. Right, and, and, and starting with our, our black men. There's a, there's a question um, and I'm gonna just leave it open a little bit. I'm gonna ask Andre to, to, to start this question and then I'm gonna ask one other person to, to join in on this question that came in from our audience. Um, but it says, as a mother of three young black men, I wonder what the men wish what their mothers had done to fill them up with love. I'm, I'm sorry, you were, you, you were breaking up. Can you ask the question again, please? Yes. Mm -hmm. It says, the question is, as a mother of young Black men, I wonder what these men wish that their mothers could have done to fill them with love. So she's looking for instructions that in this time, um, and as a mother of three soon-to-be young men, what can she do or what would you have wanted your mother to do differently in the perspective of feeding you love? Uh, me personally, my mom did uh, a fantastic job. There was a point in time where she actually uh, got divorced and I was very young and she kind of had to step in and kind of be the, kind of play the father role, wrestling and throwing baseballs and just being there and being present. 
uh, in that type of a role until you know, my stepdad came into my life. So she did a fantastic job. When it comes to uh, raising kids, I imagine for mother or uh, father, it, it can be a difficult task, especially in today's times, uh, because this social media, I mean, kids are being raised faster. I mean, not being raised, but you know, being exposed to a lot more, a lot sooner. And the best any parent can do is to, is to be there, to be available, to be open to the conversations, to listen, uh, and, and, and understand and what, what the perspective is of, the, of their child at a given point in time and, and their development. Um, but, you know, I mean, people, you always talk about a mother's love because you, you hear about athletes and just, you know, successful people, whomever, they always talk about their mama. If mama's there, mama's present. That's really what chill, children want, to know that you're, that you're there, you're available. You know, see, people talk about, you know, men don't, boys don't cry and all that. Hey, you cry on your shoulder and, and ex- open up and express themselves. You know, they always remember that because mama was there. So the best thing is just to be available uh, and, and, and just shower your children with love. I mean, that's what I remember me personally from my mom. Yep. Yeah, no. I'll, I'll ask Carl, I'll kind of turn in uh, with that as well. Carl, as uh, giving this mother of uh, three boys, three black boys advice on tonight in, in, in supporting and helping her. You know, I would say just keep the conversation open. Uh, that's the best I could do. My my mother was very vocal. Um, you know, if everyone knows Mrs. Hill, she, she speaks her mind and uh, tells you exactly where you are at all times and, and uh, right, wrong, or indifferent. She would give it to you. And I found that pretty uh, reassuring because you always knew where you stood with it. There wasn't anything you had to, to guess from, from, uh, from Mrs. Hill. So I would encourage you know all mothers to do the same uh, because the less you know black men have to you know think about black and white or what's gray right because I think when you get older you see a lot of gray out there but you know from, from zero to I say twenty five it was very black and white in my household thing so the more you guys can do that for the three boys I think the better off they'll be to see you know life in that that uh, that way. Aston, you were getting ready to say something as well. Yeah, a couple other quick points. Uh, number one, kind of just reinforcing that communication piece. I know a lot of times as males, um, we tend to internalize things. Uh, we don't tend to kind of let it out. Um, and, and sometimes that could equate to something, you know, a negative outcome, right? Um, but the second thing is uh, something that I learned from a uh, ProPublica article that was written maybe two or three weeks ago. It was It's called you know, how COVID-19 hollowed out a generation of young black men. And it particularly talks about um, the the folk tale of John Henry, who was kind of like a Steve steel driving man who defeated a, you know, steam powered drill and died with a hammer in his hand, right? Um, And I think, you know, bringing that analogy to today's times, what what happens with black men is, is, is we're so, caught up in, in trying to break through these societal barrier, barriers, you know, kind of trying to support a family, support children, support a wife, uh, and, and, and the stress related to our, our everyday day jobs. And what happens is that stress ends up killing us. And it is one of the leading reasons why COVID has exponentially impacted African-Americans, but particularly Black men. Uh, and so, you know, making sure that we're reinforcing to our black men the importance of taking care of yourself. I just had my my physical a couple of days ago, my blood work done. I mean, checking your checking your blood sugar levels, checking all these things, right? Um, prostates, um, it's particularly forty on up, right? So the late millennials, <laughs> um, um, you know, really, really, you know, you want to kind of be there for your family. You want to make sure you're you're taking care of yourself. And I think that's something that we as black males don't do as well uh, as, as our, our sisters do. Uh, and my wife does, she stays on me <laughs> repeatedly about this stuff. So that's all I would uh, add. Um, just to, just, to, uh, just to piggyback, just to piggyback, I think uh, what's key for youth now is that what, what they have and we don't have is social media, which really has more influence than we give it credit for, especially for a young developmental mind who is you know, they're attracted to, and everything on social media is a lot, people aren't posted in their failures. So you get kind of a false sense of self and a false sense of what is to be glorified and what isn't. So I think the best thing you can, the service you can do to a kid is really instill him a strong sense of self, 
uh, of self-love and having an idea of, of who he is so that he is not so swayed and easily influenced by all the images that they're constantly inundated with in social media and society. And they can kind of navigate based on those principles of self that uh, they got from their mother, from their parents. So I think it's important because if you, if you kind of leave them out there for it to be decided, then it can land anywhere because, you know, with the stroll of a finger with a click, it's you're, you're off into so many different worlds and opinions and images and likes and it's really kind of diluted uh, and kind of interrupted a person's uh, chance to develop their own mind and own sense of self and own goals and what is right and what is wrong because it's, as soon as they turn that phone on, it's being decided for them. I love that. That's a powerful point because so, uh, social media is the norm for us and that is an inf a powerful influencer in our life. And for so many young people, um, that is what is guiding and, and giving first instruction of things that they see and they hear. Um, so I thank you all for that. I'm gonna take one more question. There was one more question here. And also um, just to reference in the chat for our audience, um, one of our audience participants actually placed an article that Justin was, was speaking to and referencing. They, they have read that article and they placed that in the chat. So if you want more information on that, that is in the chat for you. And thank you for that. Um, I love how our audience is participating tonight. Um, we have another question. Um, that I want to kind of look at and address here. Um, and I do want to take note that many of these people are, are saying how much they love this conversation and they're hoping that there's a part two and they're thanking all of you um, for, for, for participating. I want to address this one to um, Benjamin. Um, Benjamin, it says here that um, there are uh, the predominant influences of Black youth, philanthropic interest, specifically their interests, we're looking at hip hop culture focuses, um, and sometimes it often overshadows the promises of philanthropy. Um, when we're looking at Black Lives Matters, how, how that pivots backwards towards the importance of looking out for each other. And in their question, they're asking, um, can you kind of speak to the relevance of what we're seeing in hip, in hip hop right now and also seeing um, the contrast with Black Lives Matter and how that is uh, affecting young people in, in terms of giving and being philanthropic? Well, um, so when it comes to hip hop culture, I think we do suffer a lot from yeah, the lyrics of the music is very, uh, a lot of the music, not all of it, uh, is, you know, very self-centered. Look at me, look at what I have. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have any exact references right now, but I, I have seen um, in, a, in a similar way of what we discussed earlier, where there are people who give back that may not talk about it, right? So I think as much as it's not as predominant in the lyrics. There are a lot of people that I probably don't know what they gave because they, they might not have publicized it, but I do know artists who give back. So I think um, as a short version of the answer to the question, um, the lyrics I don't think are really helping to promote a culture of giving back. Um, the artists themselves I think often do but I think we need to find exactly T.I. Yeah, I see that in the uh, in the comments. T.I. gives back all the time. Killer Mike. Like there's so many people in our in our community, you know, from generating jobs, just all like when we talk about philanthropy and really dealing with the whole person, not just doing a, a transactional thing. We have so many examples of that. Um, but the the one compromise and challenge that I think it, it just being in the hip hop culture that we need to work on is finding a happy balance between the look at me and what I have and whatever that song is about. Cause I mean, you know, I work in radio, we play a variety of different songs about different stuff. And it's like, sometimes, yeah, people don't want to hear a conscious message. Like I slide it in when I mix stuff. I, I like to play music that has a message. Um, and even the mix I'm doing for tomorrow morning, um, I, I slid some stuff in there, but I think it's not no, so much as a straight answer, but it's just something that we we need to work on. Um, and I and I like like someone like Lil Baby. Uh, what's the name of the song? The Bigger Picture, right? So he made a song and he and he addresses everything right then and there. Um, now it's not his most popular song. They want to hear We Paid or Yes Indeed. I'm not sure if you all know all these songs, but you know he made a song where he addressed it. So I think if we just kind of start there, so the, the answer to the question honestly is yes and no. So. 
it's not as predominant as I honestly, as a DJ, think it should be. But at the same time, we have the TIs, we have the little babies, we have the killer mics, we have people in hip hop culture, we have people that I might not know about. Like, you know, the Migos may be doing something right now to give back. I know Greg Street works with a lot of hip hop artists and they give back all the time. So if we kind of shift our focus uh, to make sure that the lyrics highlight more of that, I think we'll be in good shape. Um, but yeah, in a, in a short version, yes and no. You know, there are so many people that are doing stuff. But the lyrics don't necessarily highlight it as much as I personally uh, think it should. And I don't think it necessarily promotes it as much as I think it should, you know. But we, we are doing things in the community. Yeah, and I think it is important to, to mention that um, philanthropy does not always have to be um, front of the page, right? When we talk about philanthropy and we talk about giving in the community, Remember, it's time, it's talent, it's treasure, and it's you impacting that neighbor, impacting your family, impacting the neighborhood that you used to live in. Um, and it does not always have to be a front page splash. And we, we have to really recognize that we do have some everyday heroes in the Black community um, and, and with Black males. Um, I'm going to kind of close out this section. I know we ran over time, but I think this was a rich, robust conversation. And our audience definitely is still will, here with us. Um, but I have, a, I have one last question I, that I have for Carl. And um, Carl, I want to know with uh, the COVID impact for your experience at home, you have um, two small children under the age of seven, um, but your wife is a physician and she's a frontline worker, right? And so I want to take the time to acknowledge um, the sacrifice, the frontline sacrifice that your home personally um, is dealing with, with you, with really young kids that I can only imagine that level energy they have of uh, being pinned up and isolated in the home while your wife is out fighting COVID-19 firsthand. Um, I'd love for that to just be a closing perspective as a Black man and as a father and as a husband, um, what how that has impacted your life tonight. Well, you know, I think it's been very invaluable. And I think about what my wife is doing every uh, day and uh, what she's truly uh, leading. And I talked to a friend over the weekend and you know, we, we both have OBGYN uh, wives and we feel very honored because what they do every day is, is, is truly important, right? Think about what a bad day is to you in your business. You might miss some sales numbers, but what a bad day looks like to them is drastically different and what you have to, to do on top of that. Then you add in COVID-19 and, you know, the pandemic when everyone's at home, you know, there's still tasks to go in. And, um, you know, them, and, and I will put a shameless plug out there for Xavier University having the most African-Americans graduated from med school uh, for HBCU. I have a lot of friends that are physicians and uh, fr frontline workers, and uh, they're heroes. And quite frankly, it's gotten everybody to wake up, in my mind, to see, uh, especially in the Black community, right? Because we take that for granted in Atlanta, because we have so many Black physicians, how special they are and how we should you know, definitely look to them uh, with the love and respect that they deserve. But the home, the family, they know mommy's a hero. And every day when she leaves, you know, we, we tell her uh, good luck and we'll see her at home. We want to hear about all the babies she, she delivered. We always want to hear that when she comes in. Thank you. Thank you. I know there are so many. Thank you, first of all, for her sacrifice and for your personal sacrifice as, as her husband. Um, I can only imagine the stresses that, that and the stories and the moments, the emotional um, responsibilities that you have with your family as, as we go through this COVID-19. I wanna thank all the panelists tonight. We have many more questions that have popped in. Um, those of you that have joined us, if you will uh, send your unanswered questions to alumni at msm.edu. This conversation is so powerful and, and so important, we will make sure um, the the uh, alumni and um, constituent engagement team, as well as myself, um, we will make sure that your answers uh, are, are given and that your questions have been heard. And if you have something specifically for a panelist, we will um, definitely get that to them and, and allow you to hear the Black man's voice on tonight in the 20th century. I want to thank all of our guests here. You guys are amazing. I'm, the time went by quick, and I really could do some more time with you guys. It's, it's phenomenal. We don't get to hear this that often. So I want to thank all of you for doing that. Again, I want to thank the Office of Alumni and Constituent Engagement, um, the Morehouse School of Medicine staff for doing an amazing job for doing this. I want to thank you for allowing me to be um, your, your host and your, your moderator on tonight. It was an honor and a privilege 
for each of, to be with each of you. Um, I want to thank each of the amazing kings here tonight. You are all kings, and you do our community proud. Um, I don't care what we see in the news and in the media. You are proof across every generation um, of the impact that that is happening, not just for now, but for the future. And I want to I want to thank you for that, and thank you for sharing your time and your passions and your engagement on tonight. Um, tomorrow night, I just want to take care of a few little housekeeping things. Um, if you are interested in giving in your philanthropy, we've got um, students who will be the future first line responders um, here at Morehouse School of Medicine. I want you to remember them um, with the giving code of MSM Tuesday. You can text that. I'm gonna ask our administrator to put that in the chat so that you can find that. And you can text to 41444. Um, so we wanna thank you for all that you have done and all of your benevolence on tomorrow night. See, we're not just talking about philanthropy and then leave you empty handed in your pocket. Tomorrow night, we're talking about investments and stocks, the discussion with Derek Murray. So those of you that can join at 7.30 on tomorrow, um, the alumni office is giving another amazing conversation with that group. Thank you to Dr. Harris, to uh, Keith Robinson, to Benjamin Technology. Uh, we're going to, DJ Technology, we're gonna be listening to you, I'm sure again, dancing to some tunes on our Friday night because I, I absolutely have been one of those ones. So I appreciate that, your time, talent, and treasure. Um, Justin Tanner, we want to thank you. Andre Williams, we want to thank you on tonight. Jarvis Sam, Terrence Robinson, Gabriel, we want to thank you as well. Um, and to Carl Hill, we want to thank you for being amazing men on tonight. I'm going to ask the panel if you would stay for a little bit. I want to thank the audience on tonight. I want to thank uh, Rochelle Lindsay for her time and effort. She has been um, stellar. We give her a hand clap. She has been stellar to making this happen. Um, and we're going to ask our audience, thank you, however you were watching, whether you were streaming on YouTube, whether you're on Zoom, whatever platform you're watching tonight, we want to thank you for being here with us. And good night. Thank you.